And, and I know Mary is here. I'm going to get started by reading our opening uh, prayer. I'll do it in English today. Blessed are you, Marty, and I Marty, are God. Marty. Yes. I just am going to leave early and I apologize for that. Nothing to do with okay. you. Don't take it personally. Hope everything is okay. Hope it, it's all okay. Yes, yes, Good. yes. Good. Yes, yes. Uh, the, in English, uh, blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe. You have sanctified us through your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves in things of Torah. Amen. Well, uh, it is, uh, it, it, uh, I'm going to ask David to read our, uh, also our opening reading. Thank you, Marty. Uh, this week's reading comes from someone new who I, I would be happy to give a year's retirement pay if someone could point me the way to some poetry of this rabbi. His name is Rabbi Levi Ben Gershon. And uh, there's a, I first heard of him when I was a young boy. <laughs> Turns out there is a crater on the moon named after him, a very large crater named after him. He's also known as Hersonides. He was born in 1288, and as far as we know, he died in 1344, although he may be still alive, we don't know. And all I was able to find is this. He wrote, do not lose sight of wisdom and understanding, but preserve them always. This is really a reflection from the 19th Psalm. Day unto day yieldeth knowledge, night unto night yieldeth wisdom, so long as the sky is clear. But uh, I'm trying to find some poetry of this man, but I haven't been able to yet. So that's my quotation of the day. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Uh... Let me see if I can find something for you. Uh, I, I just uh, found this information. Uh, the the uh, Gersonides was uh, born Levi Ben Gershon. Levi Ben Gershon. That's right. And uh, he was a very interesting uh, person. Uh, he was a medieval French Jewish philosopher, Talmudist, mathematician, physician, and astronomer, astrologer. So I thought it was, uh, uh, it, 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 there, there's some other information, but it would be interesting. Uh, he, he wrote a lot of, uh, did a lot of work in astronomy and astrology. Uh, at one time, as, uh, at, well, I should say at that time, astronomy was, uh, was uh, just being thought of. Uh, and, and astrology was still considered a science. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so the people who did this were very instrumental in, in they needed the exact location of planets and the moon in relationship with the sun to make predictions. Yeah, thank, thank you, Marty. And as well, in order to do that, uh, Rabbi Levi invented an instrument still in use called the Jacob's Staff that uh, is used to measure angular distances between the stars. And it's still used, it's still used. in fact, uh, uh, Gene Shoemaker taught the Apollo astronauts to use one back in the uh, early 1960s. Gonna take, uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to take, why do you, th I'm going to ask the rest of everyone, why do you think uh, ancient uh, tools were given to the astronauts? I, not you, David. <laughs> not, not you, David. Think about it. 
why would they be given ancient tools to de to make various determinations? Because they worked. Yeah. Yeah, in case the computers broke down, they could still take measurements of their positions in space relative to the Earth. And so they'd be able to probably get home. Okay? And it, it, because it's all very mathematical. It's not like in Star, Star Trek or Star Wars, where you push a button and everything happens. Uh, it, it, it's extremely mathematical. But anyway, thank you, David, for th this. And I apologize for my digre digression. Anyway. Uh, I, yes. Even today, uh, pilots carry astrolabes. Yes. Um, and in some airliners, there are ports above the cockpit. So you can see the stars from out there yeah. as a backup. These happen, and this is the best we know. Uh, it would have been nice to uh, 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 have use of a true uh, Antithacara device, which was found in the waters of <coughs> Ant Antikythera, which is uh, I, I, I may, I'm probably not pronouncing the, the Greek well, uh, but it is a series of gears, metal gears that were, if, uh, that, that were set up. Uh, and it, uh, it has been determined to be a, a very uh, similar form of the astrolabe in addition for future predictions of where planets would be and, and, and other, other uh, 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 astrologic events. So it, uh, it, it, you can buy copies of it, but the original would have been phenomenal. It was found in a sunken ship off the island of Antikythera in Greece. So anyway, enough of that, uh, you know, uh, in, useless information unless it comes up in discussion <laughs> some, some day in the future. Anyway, uh, let's get on with uh, our reading unless anyone has any uh, comments about things. We're about to cross the uh, Sea of Reeds. Uh, so uh, we finished with our discussions about uh, 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 about the angel of God, and we, uh, you know, who uh, is going to uh, be the cloud, the pillar of uh, smoke and fire uh, that uh, leads and protects the Israelites. Uh, so anyway, so we are in Exodus 14, verse 21. Yes, Michael. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question, Marty. Yeah. I thought about this before we go too far. If there's any connection with the uh, uh, with the ten plagues that God delivered to Pharaoh and Egyptians, and the ten commandments, is there any connection whatsoever between those two? And and what is the period of time between those two events? Okay, well, you probably can answer some of that, okay? If God is doing battle with all of the Egyptian gods, okay, the very first commandment becomes very obvious. You shall have no other gods before me, okay? And, uh, and the other, uh, the, uh, the following commandments... Uh, probably relate more, uh, such as honoring your your uh, your parents, uh, and etc. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, it 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 would imply that their teachings were very important. Those who had remembered basically what had the events in the Book of Genesis. Uh, 
uh, if they had remembered, and there are hints, there have been clues that we've discussed that at least some of them knew it, uh, then honor your parents. Sure, because that's the teaching. Okay, and, and, and likewise, some of the behavioral things uh, that we, you know, to uh, thou shalt not kill, uh, uh, or as you say, murder. The Christian version says kill, Jewish version says murder. Uh, the, uh, and some of the other characteristics were, were actually, if you think about some of the stories we read in Exodus, so if you remember the stories in Exodus and what leads up to, uh, the, if you will, the return of God into the, the picture following all the suffering of the people, uh, there are a lot of different examples. I can't relate them specifically to each one of the plagues. Okay, now there may be a, res a, a resource but I can understand how different aspects of the Ten Commandments would relate to events uh, surrounding all of the, this story. Okay, uh, but, but specifically to the Ten Commandments, I cannot. Are you aware of anything, Michael? Or uh, Rabbi Mary? No, I, I, I'm not. It was just curious that uh, God delivered delivered 10 plagues mm -hmm. to the oppressors of the yes. Israelites. And then sometime after delivered specifically, like you were talking about the 10 commandments to the Jews, that, that number, you know, uh, it's, it's the same. And there's a, a coincidence or is it a, a coincidence on purpose? So <laughs> okay. I don't know the, the answer. Yes, Ricky. We got 10 fingers. We got 10 toes. I mean, it's a 10 is just an easy number to remember. It's Was there number. any significance to the number 10 that you know of, uh, Rabbi Mary? No, actually, I don't. I mean, I know 40. I know seven. Yeah. I mean, think about all the numbers that we say in uh, Pesach. Echad Eloheinu, Shtei Luchot Abrit, etc. No, I think, I, I don't know. I, no. As, what's the tense in the uh, Pesach? Ten, ten Commandments. Um, no, I'm sorry, Michael. I, I don't know if there is, I, I'll buy the coincidence with you. 40 is a very strong number. Seven is a number. Right. Um, but I'm sorry. Eight, 18 and 36. Yes. 18 is high at 36 is double high. Well, and that's life. So, right. you know. Yeah, but 18, mm. 18 is a much later thing when there was gematria, when we translate the letters into numbers. But as far as Torah, it yeah. um, doesn't happen, neither 18 nor, because that represents Chai, which is, right. as I said, Gematria. Right. Gematria is the science of translating the letters into numbers. Because in Hebrew, we count by letters. We don't count by, uh, by right. numbers. Well, Lynn, yes. Yeah, Yud is 10. And Yud is the first right. letter of God's name, God's holy name. The other, the other relationship, human relationship to 10 is as Ricky fingers, said. ten toe, you know. Right. So maybe it Seven. was to be re recited like the Seven. children have to, I don't know. I, I just don't know. Seven also, I believe, would be a a number that yes. uh, is, is yeah. uh, very dominant. You have seven days in a week. Yeah. You also have, this is interesting, you have seven openings in the head, in the face. Two, four, five, six, seven, yeah. The ears, the nose, the eyes, the mouth. And you also have seven levels yeah. in heaven. 
Well, seven is because the seventh day is Shabbat. Yes. So uh, that's a connection. So I'm saying in my knowledge is 40 and seven are numbers that might be. Uh, regarding 10, I cannot help to yeah. think about anything that's relevant. Okay. One, one well, other. I don't want to. Okay. Just one thing. Uh, there's all. It's uh, at, at the end of Yom Kippur. It said it said seven times. Uh, I don't know. Oh, hello, Im. Yes. That said seven times, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but but Michael, uh, there is something, and I'm just mentioning this, that you need to separate the Torah from the traditions from the Talmud. Uh, and the prayers are a collection that Rabbi thought, oh, this is neat, I'll put it in. The problem is that they keep putting in and they don't remove anything, but <laughs> that's why the services are so long. But, um, but what you're talking about in the prayer of Yom Kippur is, a, uh, is an addition much, much later. But you're absolutely right, and you mentioned the face. I mean, you know, we can play with it quite a bit. But as far as Torah, um, I don't know about the ten. Okay, David, and then back to Lynn. I think Lynn was had her hand up again. No, okay, uh, yes, David. Thank you, Marty. A ten also happens to be the basis of our counting, counting. system. That's not. No, we go back to them. Sure. Well, that that came later. I don't think so. I think it goes back to biblical times. A base ten is uh, the foundation of our of our system of counting. Well, that's because of our fingers. That's what I said. Because yes. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. Yes, but uh, it comes back to that. Okay, Don. I'm going to give you the last word. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to mention that every language has its own numerology and, and there's layers of superstition and meaning and, you know, I don't think I ever get to the bottom. I know in Japanese, if you count Ichini, Sanchi, Goroku, Chichihachi, number four is the same word for death. So they have a substitute word, Ichini, Sanyon, instead of Shi. So, you know, it just goes back and, into the darkness. I don't think we'll ever know. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So we are on Exodus 14, verse 21. Any who would like to, to read? Well, I can start it. Yeah. Okay, Davi. And Moses stretched out, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all the night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the children of Israel went out into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Okay, let's let's stop at that point, and we'll come back to the reading in, in a second. Any comments so far? Uh, Did, um, have you seen anything about uh, other people crossing yet? Or is the other people who cross before Moses hold up his hand, uh, is that Midrash? Because that's been mentioned several times in discussions. Yes, David. One thing is that the uh, that Exodus actually tells us is the mechanism that God used 
to part the waters. Yes. He simply used a strong east wind. Mm -hmm. That explains a lot more than the Bible usually tells us. But in this case, it defines how God did it. And it must have been an extremely strong east wind. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah, I I think that uh, Lynn told the story. Lynn, do you want to repeat the story about Nachshon? Nachshon so um, this is in Talmud. I know it's not just, it's in, I'm, I don't know the reference, but it is Talmud that um, they're standing there and he's, the, the waters, you know, that the waters are still there and the, the Egyptians are coming closer and nothing's happening. And Nachshon ben and Minadab, who I believe was like a prince, somebody high up in the, in the tribe, steps forward into the water. It's like, you know, like you have to, we have to move forward. And he kept going and the water keeps rising. It's at his knees and then it's at his waist and then it's at his shoulders. And when it came up to his chin, the water started to, to, to recede. And the idea was that somebody's got to move forward and you can't just keep waiting. There's a, an element, I guess, of trust and faith in there um, that has to be physically expressed. Yeah. The other point is that as a, as a metaphor is that he didn't jump into the water, so the water covered him. It was step by step. So when we want to do something, it won't be at once. It takes someone and it takes step by step until it arrives. Okay. Yes, Ricky. You know, I haven't brought up 12-step programs in a while, but we, there's, everybody knows the expression, easy does it. You know, you can step by step by step, easy does it. But most of us say, easy does it, but do it. You know, so that's what Nasham did. He did it. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. Easily. Marty? Marty? Yes. Is that yeah. how end up? Look, if we go back to creation, God's breath, spirit winds. So that wind of God um, we have a precedent for. But also in the birth process, one of the first signs is um, someone breaks water. And so that could be another metaphor for here. Very, David. very good. Very good. Yeah. Uh, what does and you're the right. The word, yeah, the way the word ruach is one of the words for soul. You know, ruach Elohim and, and, and so forth that has to do with breath. Now, also the Chinese said, don't they, that a long walk, uh, walk starts with one step? Yeah. That, that idea yeah. is probably... A thousand miles starts with a single step. Right, I, I just right. took some time while you were explaining some things to look up uh, the name Nashan. No, sure. Okay, and what I and the reason I did that is, well, you know, we periodically come up with th that the names sometimes have meanings behind them. It's just not the name necessarily the name of a person. So d does anyone know what the name of Nashem means? N-A-S? No, no, no. Look in Hebrew. <laughs> That's yeah. right. I don't. And it means, it means, uh, just a minute, uh, truth and wisdom leading to future experience. Where do you take this from? Eliminating the path to the future. And this is and, and what's from your source? A names, what's your names, 
www.ghostsandghosts.org. I have not come up with. Ah, other, okay. But well, this, this, yeah, go ahead, uh, Marty. But, but before we attribute it to a person, it would make sense if these are not people, but just the comment that the that you have to have uh you know belief in your future based on truth and wisdom yeah i don't know about uh truth i need to continue looking at it sure but the the word nachesh which is the nachash nachash mm-hmm. is in one way it's a snake but at the same time is um, uh, when you want to uh, guess, it's the word guess, and Ben Ami, the son of my people. So it could be, you know, uh, guess, son of my people. Um, and, and yeah, and Nahesh is something that's hidden that we don't know. Uh, that it exists, but uh, we don't know about it. But I don't know, the rest of you saying I need to think about because I don't see it uh, immediately. It could very well be. Okay, yes, I I, I just don't know, Uh, you know, what what any other uh, um, it, you know, the, the, it, is there a reason now for a snake? Remember, the Hebrews had been exposed to a snake, the, serp- the serpents in the Nile. They have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, the worshiping of snakes by the Egyptians. Is there anything in, in that regard? Well, s- snakes were, of course, a symbol of royal power. The yes. Cobra. Yeah. Yes. Very. Um, sometimes it, it was usually placed on the forehead of the uh, the king in his images, a cobra. And um, in one of the dynasties, it was actually a double cobra. Um, so it was uh, definitely a symbol of power. Yeah. But in the future, and Marty, you should know about it. Where do we use, in what symbol do we use the serpent? The, the... Oh, yeah. It, 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 well, the serpent has many different uses, and one of which is the, on the caduceus uh, that for uh, the, the uh, serpent wrapped around a cross, if you will. Uh, yeah, but you have it, it can also in be a the sword. symbol. The, the symbol of medicine. Yes. And that appears in the Torah is you have that and the serpent. So it may be that something in the uh, in the serpents was maybe, maybe the uh, the poison <laughs> had to do. But that's a symbol in the Torah of medicine. Uh, as an aside, since you bring you brought us up the subject, mm-hmm. most people are unaware that uh, that many of the herbal medicines in larger quantity were poisons. Okay, the most familiar one to most of us because of our age is digoxin, foxglove, comes from foxglove, which was used to stop the hearts. Of of people, as when it was oh, used, as poison. so yeah, it, oh, that's all it was. But, but in controlled amounts, it would be beneficial to the heart. So it, it's it, there are other th- poisons too used in cancer treatment, etc. Sure, yes. Um, I'm remembering the uh, time. I can't remember exactly what the context was, but Moses stops a plague by holding up a rod with the symbol of a serpent on it. There's a plague, Rabbi Miri, maybe you remember the context. I don't, but I remember that the first time that he goes to Pharaoh, he takes his fast, 
a staff, it put it water. on the ground, and it turns into a Serpent, Yes. Yes, Don. Uh, another another thing about a snake that I really believe is that in periods of, of uh, hot celestial disturbance, um, the aurora borealis comes down a lower latitude, and once you get it, these huge uh, snakes up in the in the night sky, these, these weaving snake-like formations of plasma. Um, and personally, I think that they have a great influence on ancient stories because nobody could ever explain them. They just look like big, bright snakes weaving up over a head, overhead in the night sky. Now we know what they are. Okay. Yeah, yes, uh, Suzanne. Um, in answer to Lynn's uh, question, <clears throat> The seraphs were um, let loose on the uh, Israelites, and I forget the reason for it. But if they were bitten, if an Israelite was bitten by one of these things, um, death would surely follow. So in order to be saved, <clears throat> Moses um, had a bronze uh, figure made of this seraph thing and and uh it was put up on um like a a pole or something to elevate it so if if someone was bitten all they had to do was turn and 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 look at this uh at this brass uh figure and and then they would be cured Okay. Thank you. Yes, Larry. Um, let us not forget the snake or the serpent in the grass. Um, going back to Genesis again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Larry. Yes. Uh, so that's why we said it can work either way. Okay. So. Uh, maybe that's why the uh, snake is used in the caduceus, that just because the doctor says something, it doesn't always work. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> or if you use herbals, they don't always work. <laughs> Does it? Yeah. Okay, enough, enough of that. Any, um, any other comments? I think I was. I just have a... Um... Uh, interpretation from the Chabad site that the name Nachshon was given to him after he jumped into the waves, which they say is Nachshol. Ah. Okay. Which is a wave. Yeah. Okay. Now rem remember, sometimes you have to look at all of these different interpretations as commentary. Yes. To fill in missing blanks. Okay, yeah. Helene, did you have something? I did, because I can't stay long. Um, difficulties, hard times, and all, all of these interpretations, what do we learn from the negatives? What the negative and the positive, I hear, are bouncing back and forth here. And the question is, God, God wants us to learn. And sometimes it's the negative that teaches us everything. That's all I wanted to say. It does. And the negative is, is probably the most powerful teacher. If you, if you think about the different examples in each of our own lives, it is something that we, uh, uh, that is, if, you, if everything always happens and, and you're always correct, there's something wrong <laughs> with that picture. Uh, you may think everything is correct, but it may not, it, in reality, there's always a, a, a hitch somewhere. But, uh, but you need to, but if you use those negative events, I always have called them in the past uh, learning experiences. Mm 
Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. That was very important. So any other comments about what we've been reading here? So the, uh, in verse uh, 23, the Egyptians came in su- pursuit after them into the sea. All of the Egyptian army, uh, excuse me, all the horses, chariots, and horsemen. Any comments about that? Well, the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't. Ah, them. very, <laughs> very interesting. I know. Uh, every time I. Well, uh, is, is there a relationship somewhere? Well, they didn't get Humpty Dumpty back together again, did they? That's correct. That's, That's where correct. I'm going. Well, certain so, kinds of power cannot accomplish the goal. That you certain you, it's not accomplished by physical. Yes. Very well stated. Very well stated. So it, it, as we go through this, you go, it, it, this story, there are a lot of different um, uh, parables and uh, poems that may come to mind, uh, uh, books that you've read, things like that, pieces of art. Okay, it, it, there's a tremendous amount of art devoted just to this one event. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's just a very interesting uh, way of looking at this as well. So if somebody would like to pick up with this. Uh, yes. Uh, Marty, okay. you know, some people might be uh, concerned. I think that Ricky um, uh, alluded to that that we're talking about human beings now. It's not just the chariots and the horses. On the other hand, the horses could not move without human beings. The chariot needed to be moved, but human beings. So the connection is, you know, it wasn't robots that did that. So unfortunately, there was participation of humans into this, Uh, pursue and having uh, military things. And if we think about today, yeah, well, you know, the the bombs just fall and the the rockets just fly, but someone does it. Yeah. Good points. Good points. Who would like to read from verse 24? Go ahead, David, but you have to unmute yourself. They will try. Okay, there you go. And it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked forth upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of cloud and discomfited the host of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels using a screwdriver and a drill and made them. Go ahead. Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. <laughs> okay. Well said. <laughs> Sorry about the editorializing. Okay, it's okay. It's just all right. Uh, any uh, so any. <laughs> I can't get the, the that out of my head with the screwdrivers and all that. <laughs> How <laughs> else? <laughs> Any comments? Yes. Tom. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm glad. Thank you, David, for that. Uh, <laughs> um, but I find that I find that um, little detail comedic. I mean, because God, with all His power, looking down through the the pillar of fire and smoke, and out of all the things he could do to impede the Egyptians, he decides to take off the chariot wheel. So to me, that's like a, a, a part, it's comedy, because all of a sudden I'm thinking um, the Egyptian chariot rider saying, what, oy vey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> My my book has a different 
has a different uh, uh, word that's used. Yes, Larry. Um, to show how a so-called insignificant act, um, let us think about for want of a nail, a horseshoe fell off, for want of the horse, the yeah. rider was lost, for want of the rider, the whole battle was lost. That uh, these little things can add up and become profound. Very well put, very well put. I do feel bad about the horses though, because uh, you know the horses are gonna perish uh, alongside the soldiers. Come back to that. Come back. We can come back. Yes, Rabbi Mary. I'm looking at the translation that I have, uh, yeah, I have and it says, one. And Egypt said, I shall flee before Israel, for Hashem is waging war for them against Egypt. In Hebrew, he says, Because God fought them in Egypt. Be Mitzrayim, which means that they remember what happened in yes. Egypt to think about their God. It's not that he is doing it against Egypt. He says, Ki Adonai nilcham lahem be Mitzrayim, in Egypt. So they didn't forget what happened before. Right. Good point. Good, very good point. Any other discussion? Yes, Lynn. I don't know if this was said, but there's two interpretations of what's going on with the wheels. Yes. Go so ahead. I don't know if you want to go into that, but one, my translation, English translation says he locked, God locked right. the wheels. And Alter says, well, it was so mucky that the wheels got stuck in the mud. And then as they drove forward, they split. And so they fell off. So it's both. They fell off and they were locked. God works through practical means with a screwdriver. <laughs> it, it, so I know we've taken this apart, but... Uh, uh, I, I, do you call God's actions the work of a handyman? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I just... Anyway, uh, any other comments? Okay, if you would like to... Uh, uh, what else happens uh, with the locking of the wheels uh, so they move forward with difficulty... What what do the Egyptians have to say? Let's run away. That's right. And because they realize that uh, God is fighting on the on behalf of the Israelites. So, so what happens? What happens after that, David? If you would, yes, Lynn. I just have a question. So. If the Egyptians are ready to run away, why weren't they allowed to run away rather than be drowned? Excellent question. For, I'm going to ask everyone first. <laughs> Any ideas? I like that idea. It's a, it's a very appropriate and important question. Um, but but Adonai does not encourage them to, uh, to run away. Egypt says, which is interesting, Egypt as a land speaks in third language as one. Vayomer Mitzrayim, Anusa Mipnei Israel. They're talking here in singular. And Egypt said, it's not the Egyptians. And Egypt says, I run away from Israel. Because God is fighting for them, but um, uh, it, it doesn't allude that they are allowed to do it and they encouraged to do it. What do you think, Lynn? Um, 
they're encouraged to to what to run away or to stay i'm not well the only thing that they say it's they say let's run away yes right. and it seems that after that we don't know if they right. managed to do it which i doubt well i they didn't manage to do it they were they were drowned my question was why did not god allow them the ones that wanted to at least to right. run away and save life because afterwards we're told that um god in at least in a, in an agadah in the, in the talmud that yeah. god rebukes yeah. the angels for celebrating the death of these yes. these are my people right. too you know the egyptians are still my people right that kind of, that comes yeah. up a little later that's very important yeah uh but in the Torah, Adonai is not so nice. That's he right. He does things that don't fit he, with our it, beliefs. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. action is retribution. What we're going to see is retribution. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you agree with it or not, it, 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 the, the point is, in today's world, we can ask this question. In the ancient world, that question would never come up. Well, I know one of the apologies or mm -hmm. explanations, depending on your point of view, yeah. is that God needed to make a statement so that all the world knew God's power. That's good. Very That's well fine. Be. Okay, now several yeah. hands are. Don has had his hand. I, 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 Don and Suzanne, I, I don't know who had the hand up first anymore. Was it? I'll let you guys battle it out. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, go ahead, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Always a gentleman. <laughs> um, I just, I think this kind of goes back to the Abrahamic covenant, where uh, God uh, tells Abraham that whoever uh, curses, um, curses. Uh, the, his descendants will also be cursed. So I, um, I see this as a fulfillment of, uh, of that covenant. That's a very good point. Very good point. That has been mentioned also. In, uh, yes, Don. Yeah, I, I think within Exodus that uh, it's entirely consistent with God's hardening Egyptians' heart, mm -hmm. from Pharaoh to the to the commanders of the army, that he's you know he he's forcing them. But on a larger scale, I'm looking at the question of the balance between justice and mercy here, of which God is capable and has absolute authority. And so, in our modern eyes, as you pointed out, um, we tend to look at that balance a little more carefully than maybe they did right. at that time. But in this case, it's entirely justice and there, there ain't no mercy involved. That's good point. Yes, Larry. We spoke before about 10 plagues. Can you consider this the 11th plague? Ah, very good. Very I good. I about it. Thank you, Larry, yes. because I it crossed my mind at one point, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, so now we've 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 that's an excellent an excellent uh, commentary. Uh, one other factor: what would have up even until recent time? It is often said, "Take no prisoners." You've got to be ruthless. We don't agree with that. It's not in, I'm not condoning that behavior, but there are people in the world who use that thought process of take no prisoners. Okay. Uh, yes, Lynn. And the Israelites themselves did that at times when they're going conquering the land. Yes. In the Joshua. <laughs> you know, and, and forward judges and so forth. It's very ugly. It to is. My perspective, commentary on how they treated the people of the land, that they did not just kill the fighting men, but 
you know, women, children, etc. Just and this is to modern day, just to let to this week. <laughs> okay, it's nothing. It's nothing unusual. I don't condone it, but we have to realize that. Yes, yes, Larry. There is one strategy to save a few so that they can be um, a witness to what happened and also to bring the word out how severe um, they were treated. Yes, yes. And also when uh, this is going to come up, uh, very, uh, it, it, it's embedded in um, Deuteronomy. Uh, when they're to go into Canaan, if for, for people who object, uh, uh, you know, God says, one, uh, you know, it, it talks about all of this and also the concept of you, you don't completely surround, you don't completely surround your enemy, you give them a last chance to, uh, you know, for women and children to get out and like that. So there's a lot of th thought process going in <coughs> into this, <coughs> not only uh, by uh, Moses and and his cadres, it, it's also by God Himself, because it's God who tells them that. And so uh, maybe some of the things that we're seeing, uh, God is not just it doesn't always do things the same way. Some of these things that God does early on changes. As, and it's almost as if God also has a conscience, not just man. I'm going to stop at that point because it, 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 it's going to come up again and again and again. And we've experienced that following the great flood. Okay. So it, it's one of the things that it's a theme that also comes up through this. And so a lot of these stories are going to be setting an example for behavior. Okay. And that's why, that's why this becomes very important. That's why in the, in the Talmud, it talks about uh, 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 God crying after all of this. And so it, it, there's, there's more to this that, that first uh, meets the eye. Anyway, we'll get, come back to that story that Lynn was uh, brought to our attention. Any other um uh, any other comments about what we have read? Well, then let's move on. Uh, uh, David or someone else, if they want to read uh, uh, some uh, verse 26. I lost track of exactly where we're at. Verse 26. That's what I thought. Okay. And then the Lord said to Moses, hold out your arm over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians and upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. Moses held out his arm over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea returned to its normal state, and the Egyptians fled at its approach. But the Lord hurled, hurled the Egyptians into the sea. <clears throat> the waters turned black and covered the chariots, oh, excuse me, the waters turned back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, Pharaoh's entire army that followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites had marched through the sea on, on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Okay. Um, any comments? Y yes, Rabbi. Uh, if you pay attention to uh, what God tells <clears throat> Moshe to do and what he does, he doesn't use his staff. He's asking him to raise his arm, his hand. And that is something that we can discuss. But that's a difference between that and what happens in the future or what happened in the past. Very good point. Did you want to elaborate on what 
the difference was? Well, uh, I think that in a point, some people might think that the staff is a magic tool. Very good. That's that, but it's not in this case. In this case, it comes from Moshe, and Moshe follows the instructions, and he follows it to the, uh, to the word that he says. It doesn't change that. So we might think what's the difference between doing it from your own body or using the staff, as I'm saying that some might think that it was a magic mm -hmm. tool. Sure. And the way it's worded, the way it's worded, uh, you're very much on target the way you described it, that the if you want to use the word power from whence does it come and that would be some might say well the rod the, or the wand has it, it is the tool that you need to be able to cast a spell or to do something but as mary pointed out before it's the hand behind the wand okay but here it's the explanation is more specific it's the power behind the man is God. Okay, so it's it's a way of, of thinking about it. And so there are dangers, there are pitfalls, let's say, with if you focus too much on the wand having the power, there are pitfalls if you focus on the man having the power to use the wand the way he wants. But it's but we're reminded it's really God who gave the power to Moses to use the, the, the his staff, uh, you know, to do this with his own hand. Uh, we, it, it's a very important, these are very important concepts. Yeah, and I would say, you know, when you ask someone, raise your hand, you can ask anyone to do that. Uh, any person could have done that because you didn't need any weapon for that. It was just raise your hand. So uh, it comes to my mind now. I, I, I didn't think about it, uh, but it, it's a point that it's made because in the future it doesn't come that way. Okay, very good. Any other comments? Yes, Lynn. Just um, from Alter again, that this is kind of a closure of the story, which began with the Egyptians throwing the Hebrew boys into the Nile to drown. Very good. And now the Egyptian male soldiers are drowning in the Nile. So it's kind of a parenthesis in the story. Yeah, that's, that's, that's lovely. <laughs> it, 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 but that analogy can easily be made. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I, but I have to apologize, but I must leave, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to say, uh, um, hopefully I'll be able to check in from Illinois on, from time to time. But um, say, we're going to miss you. you so you better, you, I'll be you back. better sign in periodically. I will. I Take will. care now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes, uh, 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 Grace, did you have your hand up? No. Okay, then, uh, Larry. To follow up on Rabbi Miri's point about the hand, we take an oath, we yes. raise our hand, we salute with our hand. Um, hand gestures are powerful. Yeah. It's very true. I just want to remind you one more thing for all, for those who really are annoyed with God doing such a bad thing as drowning people. Uh, yeah, let's say that it's bad. But one of you know we know that there are seventy names to God, and uh, there are names. This is God who, with the army, is a fighter, 
and אל המלחמות, אל הצבא, הצבאות. So that's part about who our God is. It's not just אל הרחמן או השכינה, but he has this power as well. I hate to digress, but this thought just came to mind. With the 72 names for God, each one representing a different attribute, it's not an image of God. It is a concept of what God can do. And so as a, if we think of it that way, um, man, it, it, we, we talk in terms, speak in terms of, uh, we are made in God's image. When we, there are many aspects to a human as well the mind of a human, the mind of God. So, and I'm, I'm sort of getting into Martin Buber, okay? Uh, it wasn't he who that wrote uh, Man in Search of God? No. Or who was it? Heschel. Heschel, thank you. Uh, but, but if you, th thank you very much for that. Uh, if, but when I, I think of, of this, I, I'm reminded that all of the emotions that we have as human beings are also in the mind of God. It has been also said that by some people that a piece of God or godliness is in our, in our brain. Is this what is meant by that? That we can behave very with a lot of wrath, but we can also behave with an extreme amount of compassion and everything in between. I don't know. Any ideas on that? Yes, David. Um, one, one of the important things early, early in Genesis, it says that God created us in his own image, those four words. Yes. So that would back up what you're trying to say, that uh, even when we're, we do evil, uh, we're, we're following in the word of God. And we're going to be reading soon in chapter 15, that the Lord is a man of war. And uh, that, that one line bothers me a lot, except that the poet I was quoting earlier, Gersonides, Levi Ben Gershon, was actually, one of his tracks that he wrote was Wars of the Lord. It sounds awful, but it comes right out of Exodus. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and then and then Larry. Uh, doesn't uh, uh, wouldn't free will play into this uh, at some point? Uh, Does see because if you're talking about uh, uh, doing evil. God does things that. Uh, would you that, that you possibly can consider evil on the surface on the surface of it, mm -hmm. but you'd have to go deep just yes. to to uh, to to clarify that and to somehow come to terms with what's going on. And I can mention a few things that would be very difficult to to for me to say. Uh, but uh, that's that's and also I would think of the Holocaust 
Mm-hmm. And to bring the Holocaust into to, into 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 uh, perspective with all of this, you know, and uh, it reminds me of a uh, this uh, a little situation where there were three people, three men talking, and these three men were Holocaust survivors. One was in Auschwitz. One was in Treblinka. And one was in Dachau. And the three were deciding who had it worse while they were in the camps. And so the three said, let's, let's, let, let's ask God, let God decide. And they all asked God and God replied, I wasn't there. I don't. Good point. Very, very interesting comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Larry. As we spoke about the many aspects of God, and we have come up with a lot of examples where um, retribution, um, can we come up from the Torah with good examples of showing compassion, understanding, forgiveness? Mm-hmm. Well, even very early, when he is going to destroy uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, Abraham, you know, negotiates with yeah. him, and he kind of uh, saves some people. Um, he also saved Isaac from the hand of right. Abraham wanting to kill him yeah there are there Thank are uh, places in and and that's what the name that we go rachamim if you know yiddish is rachmones right. uh it's right. the shekhina that embraces uh but he has also that name of uh the god of wars and a god of uh mm-hmm. fighting and evil now uh michael um you know when Adam and Eve ate from the tree. They ate from the tree of knowledge, good and bad. So it's in my mind is they have both inside them. Right. Uh, And I'm asking that question all the time. I discuss it with someone I respect. If it's something that that it's so embedded in us that we cannot stop doing. I mean, look, it's, it's uh, wars never stop. You know, evil never stop. What's going on? On the other hand, good stuff also never stop. Uh, it's not, it, you might be right that it's free will, um, but <laughs> I don't know. And I think that God, was in the uh, in the Holocaust uh, concentration camps, and his evil part maybe was with the Nazis. You know, it was just that. And uh, look, you talk about survivors, so maybe God with them, with these three people. I don't know. It's a very difficult question, and I ask myself and I discuss the issue of free will. And free will is not a, uh, it's not something that that's what it is. Because you don't have free will when you are in the middle of a, of a earthquake or a tsunami. I, there are situations and places and times that free will is not going to, to work so well. Because we are not, you know, we think that we control everything. Think about it. Do we control everything? No. Probably not. Probably oh. not. Uh, but I, uh, I understand, uh, uh, Rabbi Mary. Uh, n- nothing is nothing is totally black or white. There's always a gray. There's always going to be a gray area in any situation. So there's nothing that is 100% perfect. So when I say free will, I mean it in a, in a general way. 
not in specific circumstances yeah. where where we yeah. don't where yeah. we can't we can't have free will. We don't have the build the ability because we're not God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and this is politics that I'll say. You know, Mr. Putin can choose what he does. Uh, he has that free will. He is in control of what he is doing now, and it's disgusting. But um, if if we are right that when we ate from that tree, I mean, I know it's a metaphor, but we could tell what's good and what's bad. And at that point, we can choose. But again, it's not always. I mean, you know, it's it, it, there are situations. I mean, I learned. I, it took me a long time or to grow up or to get older that we don't control everything. We don't. Well, when they ate from the tree of knowledge, the apple, what variety of apple did they eat? Got to be very careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we the, all know the only one right. that Snow White ate. Snow White ate the same one. You know, <laughs> it's a Fuji. No, uh, it actually in the Torah doesn't say apple. It says fruit. Fruit. It was yes, a fig. Yes, Grace. I think it was a fig. Oh, I thought it was a pomegranate. Well. Uh, I I always thought it was a fig, you know, for some reason it just. But it been a prune. I plant, I, I planted a fig tree and I plan to plant a pomegranate tree, so I'm covered. No <laughs> I have a pomegranate, I have a pomegranate tree. Uh, but guys, in Hebrew, it says tree. It says fruit. It doesn't define what fruit. Any other comments? I'm sorry I, I caused this digression, but it's, I think it's important to, to try to relate these uh, stories to one another uh, because it gives us a little more insight into what may be going on and, to, and definitely to try to question things. Well, that's why this, that's why this, Sunday mo this Saturday morning is so great. Well, we're having fun anyway. That's that's the, that's the uh, even better. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Any uh, any other comments? Uh, it, it's it, there are there are yeah. some people who feel that all the different events were were the result of a combination of different authors. Uh, 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 the J, P, and E versions that we've spoken about uh, to try to condense the, all of the different uh, interpretations of events, so if, if you will, into one story. Uh, but uh, it, it's, so we're going to come back to this. I, I want you to remember you know the uh all of these different events and what they may mean because we you remember uh, i said in about two weeks we're going to have a session just to talk about all of this and how what what this means to each one of us and including the cat uh. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, thank you very much for a very beautiful discussion. I need yes, to go Mary, I know today you have to Caroline's leave. birthday, and we're going to celebrate that. It's uh. a big one, just like mine. I had the one on Monday, a big oh. one again. <laughs> so Hello. thank you very much. As always, a pleasure. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you to say end in zero. Perfect. No, this time in five. Uh, in five, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and the, the, the numbers come up again. Okay. Uh, just want to, so if um, uh, David or Ricky, it, it doesn't matter. Um, um, if somebody would read ver from verse 30. 31, right? Yes. Thus the Lord delivered Israel that day from the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the shore of the sea. And when Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, 
the people feared the Lord. They had faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. Any comment? We, yeah, now, now the Israels are, Israelites are going to fear the Lord. I mean, how many times do they have to see the wondrous power before, you know? Well, they, the Lord they've, already, they've yeah. already seen it. This is a repetition of okay. the same phraseology. Yeah, but now they also have faith in his servant Moses. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And so between the two, between the two and uh, if we are going to go via the Haggadah and the answers to the four questions, we were there too. Okay. And this is a reminder for us living today as we read this. It was a reminder to our parents and our grandparents as they read it. Okay. Don't lose the faith. Yeah, I always have a problem with it. We're supposed to fear the Lord. I, I just don't want to fear. No, so okay, so stand in awe. Yeah, in awe, right? It's the same thing. <laughs> okay, you, it's a choice of words. I don't think awe and fear are the same thing at all. I can be in awe of a beautiful sunset. Doesn't mean I fear it. You know, I mean, it's just very, very different to me. Okay, and yet it's used as a synonym yeah, at times. It. Yes, Don. I'll stand by fear because in life we have to, we're afraid of things, and we have. And I, to me, uh, in Judaism, fearing the Lord is says there's only one thing to be afraid of. Forget being afraid of everything else. There is only one thing to be afraid of. So I, I'll stand by fear. Okay, okay. David. Hey, this is a Wendy. See, really oh, Wendy. Okay, good. I'm glad. I was going to ask what happened to you. No, I'm always here listening. It's great, great back and forth here. But I really think the word instead of fear is a little more encompassing and just say respect for the Lord. Because mm -hmm. you've seen the good stuff he can do. You've seen the bad stuff he can do. And you want to make sure you are respecting him. And that means you're going to get the good stuff. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, Michael. Yeah, uh, I would agree with uh, Ricky. Fear and awe, I see, as two distinct different words. Uh, you stand, uh, from my perspective, you stand in awe because of the powerful things he can do. That he can move, he can do anything. That's the awe part of God. The fear is very specific. If you're out, if you're, if you're doing something that you shouldn't do, you have, if you're, if you're a, uh, if, if you believe in God, that that's that that is over your head. You got to know that you're going to get punished. If not by the authorities, you will be punished by God one way or another. And that's how I see the difference between awe and fear. Okay, good point. Yes, Grace. Um, the word trust comes to thought for me. Um, mm -hmm. just, just because, you know, it, I understand the difference between awe and fear. I, I understand fear, and I think it's a natural feeling that we should have. There's certain things that we need to respect in order to hold that ourselves safe, right? So that's when, you know, the little hairs on the back of my neck, they just kind of, bing, they go up, and it's like there's something happening. So when the wind is going 70, 100 miles an hour and my whole house rattles, I'm a little bit afraid. But if I have trust in God, which I, I need as an existence and belief that, you know, 
it's all going to work out. It's all going to be okay. You know, um, I don't know why that trust is just a, a thing that I believe will tie all of those together. You know, respect, fear, awe. I think that for me, trust is of great importance at this point. And I believe that now they've seen that, you know, Moses really is a representative of God. He's a chosen man. They're really seeing he's not using his staff or his wand anymore. You know, he asked the, the sea of reeds to recede. And then he closed them up. And they know that God is behind this guy. And so um, I think they've, they've learned a new, a new word in their vocabulary. And, and perhaps maybe it's trust. I could be wrong. But that's just where I, I'm feeling. And that's what I think of it. Okay. It, it, it's encompassed by a word called faith. Mm -hmm. All of this discussion, uh, whatever word we, words we want to use, it, comes, it boils down to faith. You can't explain it. You look at a sunset, you stand in awe. What are you really in awe of? The image or the knowledge that this is mightier than you? You have no control over it. When you look at a newborn baby and you stand in awe looking at the child as a living being, you see it, it's beyond what you can do. Yeah, the birth took place, you know, the physical birth took place, but knowing that a new life is there is awe inspiring. And so, but as, as we get through it, a lot of, and, and all of these center around the faith that the child will, will grow up and be successful, decent, whatever words you want to use. The same thing with the son. As Annie says, she has faith. It'll come up tomorrow. The sun comes up. That's tomorrow. right. You're, fear, you're standing in awe of that sunset because darkness is going to occur which is fearful bad things happen in the dark and yet you have faith that the sun will come up tomorrow and so maybe that's the awe that we're talking about and it deals with faith i don't know something to think about uh, this is a Hasidic uh, parable. A woman came to the Belzer Rebbe entreating his help through prayer. He asked whether she had sufficient faith. Said she in the Torah, it is written that God first rescued Israel and that then they believed. Uh, Pharaoh survived. Okay, there's some commentary to that effect. And this is Midrash. It's not attributed to any particular uh, rabbi. All the Egyptians who entered the sea perished, except Pharaoh himself, who was condemned to keep God as the portals of hell. But others say, he was the last to die, condemned to witness the destruction of his army. And then the Talmud, as Lynn was saying, God does not rejoice at the death of sinners. On seeing the destruction of the Egyptians, the angels wanted to break forth in song, but God silenced them, saying, the work of my hands is drowning in the sea, and you desire to sing songs? Think about the commercial breaks that you see on TV when they're talking about disasters. Or you have to cut, or the astronauts being in, in dire straits and they have to cut to daytime programming. Think about those. 
And now think about what was just read. Okay. So, and uh, com, com, uh, uh, so all of these, uh, all of these things that we've discussed relate uh, in some way to uh, this crossing of the Reed Sea or the Sea of Reeds. And now we're going to start Exodus 15, unless there are other, other comments or questions or anything. And Exodus 15, 1, David, would you like to begin reading? Yes. Now, we're going to take this apart uh, line by line. So I'll let you go through, through the entire verse one, then let's stop. And then we'll have some discussion, verse two, three, four, four and, and, and so on. Okay. Okay, Marty, and you have just said that God has just <coughs> punished all the Pharaoh's army into the sea. And now we're going to sing a song. So then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider has he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. Well, okay, just, just, just verse one, just verse one. Any comments about this? Is this uh, taking pleasure? Is, is this first verse taking pleasure in things? I get a mixed message. He Go ahead. Gloriously is my translation. And then horse and driver he hurled into the sea. So there's the two sides. Okay. Well, first of all, it's in praise of the it's in praise of God. The first line is simply in praise of what God good. did. And it, it, it's the uh, that he, they're in praise of his triumph and, and as well as how he did it. Mm. Okay. Any and, but you can say you can talk about how how this is going to break break down and we will go to as we go from verse to verse it's uh, a, uh, it's a Marty, it's a thank you it seems yes. to me it could be a thank you to the lord for what he has done i'm he's thanking they're thanking the lord for what yes. he has done yes one of the things in in any prayer Okay, you have to, there are different types of prayers, and this is a song, uh, you know, a, a prayer of praise, but also of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we look at it as the way Michael is looking at it, we will now see, see other aspects to this as we go through it. So, uh, David, would you like to read verse 2? Surely. The Lord is my strength and song, and the Lord, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will glorify him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Okay, this sort of leads into what we were talking about just before, uh, that it's, it's, it's now it, a, a little bit of your parents. Mm -hmm. are, are involved here too and anything anything else okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah go ahead Don yeah um, I imagine that Moses and his followers would be delirious at this point sure. I imagine them what they've witnessed what they've come through and how, I mean, we, we they left with a, possibly a million people, and somehow a million people made it across the Reed Sea. Um, and the waters, by the way, the waters parted on each side, so it's doubtful it was a wind. Yeah. It's not, you know, a wind would push on one side. Um, That's right. Uh, so I could imagine that they're just, they can, they're almost speechless. Singing would be the 
the natural response to the hysterical scene. You, you, you also, I, I had forgotten to mention before, um, you, you could say that the breath of God caused the parting of the waters. That would be another way of saying this. I've known people with breaths like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, it, it so, uh, you know, it, 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 we'll come back to the overall scheme schematic uh, in, in a bit when we discuss this uh, again. Uh, so, uh, anyone want to read verse three? Well, uh, could there be some learning and teaching? I think there'll be learning and teaching of all of this. Yes. What, what did you want to say, if you want to expand on that? I'm not positive. I'm really not sure. Uh, but in a general way that if you obey God's law, he will, he will see you through whatever needs to be seen through. Good point. Good point. Any other comments? That's a good one, Michael. Go ahead with uh, uh, verse three. If somebody would read verse three, go ahead. Verse three is where we go back to Gershonides. Yes. The Lord is a man of war. I have a problem with that particular line. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Yeah, I have uh, the Lord, the warrior. Mm -hmm. Lord is his name. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, it, it's, it, it's another aspect of God. So he's, he's a savior, he's a warrior, he provide, provides you with strength, okay? So uh, verse four, if, some, uh, uh, if somebody would want to read. Well, there's different, what you just read too, there's different, it demonstrates that there are different facets, there's no end yes. to, to what, God is what he can do. There's no end. All these facets are endless. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, let's do verse four. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, and the pick of his officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. So this is, uh, any comments about this? Yeah, we've talked about restitution. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just a, a repetition of the events that occurred uh, that we had read prior to this. Mm -hmm. So verse seven, uh, verse six. Five. The five, the, I'm sorry. The deeps covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Okay. Mm. Any comments about that? Mm. We're going to read in, uh, uh, in the story of uh, 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 Korach, 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 um, the, uh, the, the earth opening up and swallowing them in, you, you, know, it, it, you know, as if the earth came alive and swallowing the men who were opposing Moses. Okay, that we're going to, that'll come towards the end of the year. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's an imagery. It's an imagery of going down into the depth of Shoal. Yeah, yeah. Some, okay. There are different depths, you know, the, the, you can either have it in, it in water or the earth because the comment is going to be made in, in, when we read Korach about, about 
show. Okay. So, any other comments about that? Yeah. Your right hand, O oh Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O oh Lord, shatters the foe. You were really glorifying the warrior side of the Lord. Of course. Any other comments besides Ricky's? It's pretty straightforward. Go ahead. Okay. In your great triumph, you break your opponents. You send forth your fury. It consumes them like straw. Okay, it's, it's exaltation again, sure. But um, this draw, is this going back to when they had to make bricks? I don't know. Well, it could be. It could also be, you know, straw, yeah. Straw just... Yeah, it straw it's it's gobbled up in, in water. And, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a turbulent ocean... But also well, the ground and everything, you blow out of a bowl. Well, straw burns easily, you know, it yes. them. So that I think of the burning aspect of it, especially in the next three words. Ooh. But anyway. Okay. I'll read eight and then Dave, David can take over. At the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up, the flood stood straight like a wall. The deeps froze in the heart of the sea. The deeps froze? That's a strange sentence. It, it is uh, very, po very poetic. Yeah. yeah. I see the dragon. I, I really, I other than that. It's, fire it's, coming out of his nose. And by the way, you see uh, in, in, in various uh, art, You'll see, that, you'll see that puff demonstrated either through the nostrils or through the mouth. You know, the, the, the caricature will have that little uh, puff in there. So there, there's a recent commercial, I think it's Cox, I don't know, about um, doing um, oh, what's a social media for people on the autism scale and they show the one kid being very angry and the image that they put on the screen is with the flaring the right. fire out of his nose that's anger <laughs> that you know uh, what is it uh, at the blast of your nostrils yes you, know. you can see Cecil B. DeMille in the background taking notes <laughs> let's go with verse 9 go ahead David okay the, in verse 9 the enemy said oh, Wendy has something to say first oh yes please um, the other night I found on one of the independent channels another version three hours of the Ten Commandments so of course we had to watch it it was yeah. The worst movie we have ever seen. You had to know the story to go with it. But the impressive part for me was really the parting of the sea because they showed Moses when he first left Egypt walking through the shallow water. And then when he brought everybody there, they started walking through the shallow water. It started to leave like pulling way out into the ocean. And then it, just as they were done and the chariots came in, Instead of it being in two parts, a tsunami came over and swallowed them up. So that was probably the best part of that whole movie was watching. <laughs> <a tsunami. laughs> okay, so it was a tsunami. Okay, I like that. <laughs> okay, let me. It could have on. been. Go ahead, David. The enemy said, "I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide thy spoil." My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Okay. So sad. Any, any other co any comments about that? I'm terribly confused. If the oh, this is before they were drowned. Okay, I was going to say it's repeating, but 
how could the uh, divide, how could the foe divide the spoil if they're all drowned? You know, that was well, it's just a repetition. It's a repetition. I realize that, yeah. And and it, 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 that's that's all it is. And and verse 10 will be a repetition too. Yeah. So you can, so uh, David, if you want to just read verse 10. Verse 10, thou didst blow with thy wind, the <laughs> sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Okay. So, uh, by the way, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, David, what is the derivation of the word plummet? I would say that it means to fall, or to fall like, not yes. like a feather, but like a stone. Like a stone. So we're doing it. And what does that, when we talk about it, um, is, is there a metal attributed to that? Well, obviously, you got lead is what you're leading up to. Yes. Well, I'm yes. thinking of a plumb line. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, it, it's it, you, you just so yeah, that's what comes to mind with with uh, with something like this. Well, we couldn't have any of this without Newton's gravity. Very true. <laughs> so they sank like lead. So they obviously knew that lead was very heavy. <laughs> you know, they all they had to do was hold a rock of lead, and then, oh man, this is really pulling down. Uh, so later, years later, Coleridge will talk about the fall of the albatross like lead into the sea. Yes. 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 I I, I like that uh, that poem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, verse eleven. Okay, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the mighty? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Okay, does anyone have a different uh, reading there? Yeah, yes. I have. Who is like you, O Lord, among the celestials? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, working wonders? Okay, and I saw Grace's hand up and Suzanne's. I don't know who was up first. Mine and Ricky's are the same. Oh, Ricky. Okay. Oh, oh, oh! You're you're reading. That's okay. That's I, I understand now. Yes, Suzanne. Yeah, mine mine says, "Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods?" Yes. Does this? Have you heard this before? Oops. Has anyone heard of this before? Yes, Suzanne. Yes, for me, uh, yes. And it, it has to do with my per, uh, personal beliefs um, because I, I take very seriously the, um, uh, the spiritual realm of, of things and um and i'm sure if we looked at this yeah. hebrew it would say among the elohim um and i i do believe that there are uh beings that god created that would to us as humans would almost seem god oh because of the, the, the powers that God had given them. Okay. Um, but they are, are not God. I mean, they were created just like we were created. Only well, we were. Okay. I, I Very found good. It, yes, Ricky. I found in my stone, uh, okay, who's like you among the heavenly powers, Hashem? Who's like you, mighty in holiness, too awesome for praise? of wonders. Okay, there are different ways of interpreting it. Awesome. But do you want to know what the Hebrew is for this? Uh, you can join in if you want to sing the melody. It's saying every week. 
in the prayer book. Mi kamocha boe lima donoi, mi kamocha nidar bakodesh, no rota hilo, no rota hilo, no rota hilo, oh, say fele. We do this every week. It's part of me. This is right out of Torah. Okay. So when you, I think, uh, I, I'm sorry, Rabbi Mary, she would have jumped to this before. But that that's right out of our uh, what we recite every Friday. And we also sing it on uh, other occasions too. So uh, it, it, other parts to Micha Mocha come from other parts in Torah too. So, it, and, and you'll see some more as we go along. Uh, so if anyone wants to, um, uh, verse, 12, verse 12. Okay, thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Okay, that's mm-hmm. and that's going to come up again as we said in the story of uh, uh, Korach. Go ahead on verse 13. Thou and thy love hast led the people that thou hast redeemed, thou hast guided them in thy strength to thy holy habitation. Okay, yeah. any comments there? Mm-hmm. Yes, Can I- Okay, Don and then Ricky. Okay. Yeah, uh, th- this is a song that I assume Moses composed. Um, and I imagine he's singing it before the people. And I'm trying to imagine that scene because there were supposed to be about a million Hebrews that escaped. And just picturing them uh, coming through the sea, I, I, I did a rough calculation that they were, if it was wide enough for a hundred people abreast to get through, then then that's a, with a hundred abreast, then that's 10,000 people in line. And if they only had three feet between them, that's a six mile queue, people making their way. At, and that's how Cecil B. DeMille p- depicted it. <laughs> so, <laughs> So it's just a fantastic scene, is what I'm getting to. Yes. Picture Moses, his you know his lungs inflated, singing this song uh, when they finally made it across. All right. Picturing the scene. Ricky, I thought you had something. To yeah, say. I did. Uh, my translation sounds different. I don't know if it really is. In your love, you lead, the, you lead the people you redeemed. In your strength, you guide them to your holy abode. But um, the, the comment here is that the word for love is chesed, which really, you know, chesed isn't necessarily love. It's um, uh, loving kindness is the way we usually yes. translate it. So in your kindness, you lead the people you redeemed. Um, I don't know what the word, uh, oh, the strength is probably Gavor. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Hey, we got some little Kabbalah in today. <laughs> okay, let's go on to verse uh, 14. All right, I'll do. The peoples hear, they tremble. Agony grips the dwellers in Philistia. Okay, the Philistines, right? Yeah. Verse, Agony- fi- verse 15. Now are the clans of Edom dismayed. The tribes of Moab, trembling, grips them. All the dwellers in Canaan are aghast. Okay. Oh, we're getting all the old guys back here. All the, all the surrounding tribes. Okay. Terror and dread to, descend. To pay upon. witness to this. Yeah. Yes. Terror and dread descend upon them. Through the might of your arm, they are still as stone. Oh, and that goes on. Uh, Till your people cross over, O Lord. Till your people cross whom you have ransomed. Any comments? 
That's yes, showing them. That's showing them all. Yes, Tom. Um, yeah, somehow I don't recall these verses, but we're looking this is canonized. We're looking 40 years ahead at this point before the Israelites make it across the desert. So we're seeing here that there's Moses is so prescient that he's seen right conquering the okay. This is prophetic. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So the exactly. Are, are shaking in their boots, and it's 40 years away before that happens. That's exactly right. So, it, well, I'll go ahead and read verse 17 through 18. Okay. You will bring them and plant them in your own mountain, the place you made to dwell in, O Lord. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so again, this is prophetic. Yeah. Right? Reread verse 18. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Does that sound familiar? Oh, we got it. <laughs> they sing it in Christian churches. They sing it in Jewish sanctuaries. Yes, but where do we sing it? Friday night services. Friday night, it's Micha Mocha. Okay, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him, Ed. Okay, I, I'm not always great at singing, <laughs> but good. it's it's good. part of that prayer. It's the ending of that prayer. So, you want to finish up with verse 19. For the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and horsemen went into the sea, and the Lord turned back on them the waters of the sea. But the Israelites marched on dry land in the midst of the sea. There we are on dry land. That's it. Okay, well, it's a repetition of, of the events. We made it. We got through it. So we, we, we got there. Um, we have a little extra time. Uh, before we get to Miriam, I want to to dis, to discuss something about the the poem. Uh, uh, the Ode of Triumph, wrote Driver, is one of the finest products of Hebrew poetry, remarkable for poetic fire and spirit, picturesque description, vivid imagery, quick movement effective parallelism and bright sonorous sonorous or sonorous dic diction this judgment was of course delivered on the hebrew or original and no translation can fully render its special flavor its rare poetic form its alliterations and assonances okay and uh, it's an, uh, for those of you who are interested in literature, uh, the phraseology, if you will, is, uh, and if you go back, you can see it in your books. Uh, they alternate between couplets and triplets, quatrains, and end in a single line, mm -hmm. which comes as a sudden glorious climax that's... Uh, the Lord will reign forever and ever and ever. Uh, and so uh, it's it and uh, uh, driver calls this as a, a symphony, a symphonic approach to, to this description. However, as Don may have been alluding to before, we're not sure if this was part of the original text. Okay, because some scholars believe that this was added to. And this was an addition to the text. And some people uh, uh, feel that it was added at a later time. Okay. Uh, it, uh, and because it alludes to events that will occur in the future. We can look at this prophetically, 
but it could also have been added in, in the, the extreme future and inserted into this location. There's no way, no one has come up with any final answer to that. Uh, but what's important, whether, whether this was written by Moses or if it was written by someone else and inserted here, it's by divine inspiration. So uh, I just wanted to uh, bring that into the discussion for those of you who may have some interest in uh, literature. So it's a, it, uh, uh, but we recite portions of this every week. Okay, so not only are we remembering this as part of the Passover celebration, we remember it we remember this event weekly in our prayer. Okay. So I, I would like to end it here because then we can spay, take a, a, a little more time going over uh, the, the dance that follows all of this because it, it's very important and uh, and I, I thought it would be worthwhile uh, to go over that as well and give it and devote a little extra time because otherwise it'll be given uh, short shrift. So, uh, so at that, so we'll put uh, stop here and we will uh, begin with, uh, uh, Exodus 15, and it will be verse 20. We'll start there next week. Okay? Yep.